I'll be home for Christmas. You can count on me. You know, for the last 80 years here in American society, that has been one of our mantras. Uh, that was made famous by Bean Crosby in 1943 during World War II. Because the idea was that if we can just get home, if we can bring our boys home, if we can just get home, everything will be fine. And that didn't end when World War II ended. Throughout America for the last three generations, we have said, my world will be fine during the holidays if I can just get back to the warm, cozy place. If I can have that ability to come in to our home and we can have snow and mistletoe and presents under the tree. You can smell it, can't you? The smell of the tree. You can smell the ham being cooked. You can smell the beauty of, of Christmas. You've got Hallmark on on the TV and everything is just fine. Well, sadly enough, for many of us, we know that holidays don't just fix everything. In fact, they are the time of some of the greatest disappointment because our expectations are if we can just make it home, then it will be warm and it will be cozy. I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you've ever spent a holiday alone, and I mean a Christmas alone, it isn't fun and it isn't all that easy. When I was a junior in college, my parents had moved from the town that I had graduated from high school in. And so I was in Medford, Oregon, and they had moved to Olympia. And I couldn't afford to go home, and they couldn't afford to come see me. And so on Christmas Eve, I went to church and spent a little time with some people there. And there was a family that was very gracious to a poor, lonely college student. And they gave me a book on gardening because they know I love gardening. And so I took that book, and I had nowhere else to go. My roommate had gone home because he had a home to go to. And uh, I took that book and I treated myself to a $7 appetizer at Applebee's. And there I sat reading my gardening book because it was Christmas Eve and I had nowhere else to go. And the next morning I woke up alone. And I was alone for Christmas and there was no snow. Well, there's never snow, come on. But there was no mistletoe, there was no presents under the tree and there was no one there cooking a ham. In fact, ironically, I thought I would buy myself a ham and accidentally bought ham hocks, which meant I bought a bunch of ham bones and nibbled off a little bit of meat. It was, there was a lot of disappointment that year. But I've been thinking and reflecting as we're looking at the Christmas story and the Christmas characters. And here's a realization that every single character in the Christmas story, not one of them was home for Christmas except for one, King Herod, the bad guy. Everyone else wasn't living a Hallmark movie. They were living an adventure. They were in an epic tale. And here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that if your expectations are about snow and mistletoe and presents under the tree, if your expectations about Christmas are all about the things that are your traditions and what you've always done, if they're about the surrounding trappings, if you will, if they're about the traditions and they're not about something deeper, you too will have a disappointing holiday, even if everything goes right, because you will miss the real story. And today we want to look at the real story. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to pull yourself up and transport yourself outside of the American Christmas story and join me on a dusty road. I need you to get dirt inside your toenails. I need you to get dirt on top of your feet as you're walking this sometimes scary road. We're going to look at the major characters of the Christmas story. And as we do that, I want you to come with me into the story. The first story I want to hit with is, is one of the central characters. Her name's Mary. Mary's about 13 or 14 years old, and she gets a visit from an angel. And the angel says, hey, greetings, you are highly favored. And Mary says, I am not used to angels showing up. And that is a weird thing to be telling me. And the angel says, hey, Mary, don't be afraid. I have good news. I have some great news. I have the news. Mary, you are going to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and you are going to be pregnant and you are going to give birth to the Savior of the world. Mary, get ready. You are about to live the Christmas story. And like no one else in history, you will get to be a part of this in a special way. And there's this great response that she gives. I want you to see this. This is in, in, in Luke 1, verse 38. The angel said this to her in her response, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What a moment. She says in response, okay, I'm in. What you've called me to, I'll do it. I'll be with you. I don't know that you've thought about this, but when 13 or 14 year old girls are told they're pregnant, usually that's going to tip the cart over and everything about what she thought life would be like is over. 
And here's the part I had never noticed until we were walking through this. It says, Mary, uh, Mary said to her, may your word be to me fulfilled. And then it says this, then the angel left her. Wouldn't it have been a little bit easier if the angel was just there all nine months? So when people show up and say, so Mary, you're pregnant. You're not married, Mary. What's the deal? Uh, yeah, talk to Gabe. And Gabe would go, hey, this is what happened. He's not there. Mary has to walk through this story without the angel telling anybody else except for Joseph because Mary is supposed to be married to Joseph. And Joseph says, this is a problem because she's pregnant and I know I was not part of this. And he didn't hear Gabriel, so he has in mind, he's a really noble guy and he doesn't want to disgrace her, but he's going to quietly say, I think we need to part ways. And what, the night he, he decides that, Gabriel comes and talks to him too. And in a dream says to him, hey, here's what happened. Let me clarify for you. You know what's cool about that? Mary's story looks like a lonely one, but God gives her just what she needs. One person to walk through in community. And the two of them are going to walk through this because Gabriel says to Joseph, hey, uh, by the way, remember how Mary's pregnant? Let me tell you how that happened. And so Joseph gets up and says, you're right, I'm with you. Well, that puts the two of them on a journey. Because the Messiah is supposed to be born somewhere other than where they live. You see, Mary and Joseph are, are from Nazareth, which is in the north side of Israel. It's way up here. But the prophecy says that, that Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, Emmanuel, was to be born down in Bethlehem. Now, it wasn't that Mary and Joseph said, hey, we got to get down there because you got to have the baby there. The Roman Empire helped out the prophecy because Caesar Augustus delivers a decree, a census should be taken. Everybody, go to your ancestral hometown, and because they were from the line of David, get on your donkey and head south. That's not easy. This is a 90-mile trek from Nazareth down into the area of Jerusalem. Bethlehem's about four miles, a little more than four miles south of that. They have to go a long, long way. And the timing of this is perfect. She's nine months pregnant. You realize she is going to leave a Roseburg, go past Eugene. And what's that? About Junction City. She has a long, long way to go. And I... I have no verifiable evidence of this on my own. I'd never lived this. But my understanding is when you get nine months pregnant, there becomes a lot of pressure on the old bladder, which makes travel difficult even in today's thing. We actually have um, a, a little footage here. This is an actual rest stop back in Israel that um, people would stop at. And I don't actually know if this was a rest stop. But you get the idea. You can imagine them moving along and Mary's like, uh, Joseph, we need to stop again. Nine months pregnant and traveling on foot or on a donkey. Ninety miles. I want you to know this. Mary and Joseph were not home for the holidays. There was no mistletoe, there was no snow, and there were no presents under the tree. It was the two of them on a journey of epic proportions. There was sand in their toenails because they were living something beyond themselves. And I want you to notice something though. Remember that verse that Mary said? Where Mary said, hey, whatever you say, I mean, I want you to notice something. That Mary was willing to obey. She says yes to the adventure. I'm in. I'm 14, 13, 15 years old. I'm now pregnant. This doesn't look good, but I'm in because you're the angel. You're the messenger of God and I will do it. I'll be with you. Let me just ask you a simple question. For many of you, you've gone through a more difficult year. I don't think this was the most easy endeavor for Mary. She spent nine months of that year pregnant and in some ways in disgrace. But you know what it says at the end of Luke 2? It says that Mary treasured these things in her heart. She pondered the actions of God and she treasured them close. Let me ask you a question. In your 2020, what are you treasuring that God's done? Maybe what you're going to need to do first is to notice what God has done. And if you look at the Christmas cards of Mary and Joseph, you'll miss that it was actually pretty tough. I don't, I don't know that your 2020 has been as hard as their year one. It was difficult. And in some ways, I think that brings me hope. Because when my hope is in mistletoe, snow, and, and Christmas trees, and ham, and presents, when, mine is, when my mindset is about how can I make it like it was, instead of what is God doing, I'll miss it, and I won't treasure what he's calling me to. And there's so much more hope in the treasure of what God is calling us to, and what he has already done. 
Mary was willing to obey, but Mary wasn't the only character in this story. There are a number of characters, and remember, all of them leave home. They leave what's normal to be a part of something bigger. Another uh, character in the story is, is a group of shepherds. They're out in the, in the fields around Bethlehem, minding their own business, and in the middle of the night, they have some intruders that show up. They have a group of angels. First, it starts with one angel who says, hey, don't be afraid. Fear not. I got some cool news for you. And then angel says to them, hey, here's what we have going on. The Messiah has been born down in that village right over there in Bethlehem. Wanted you to know about it. And then a whole host of them show up and they say, glory to God in the highest. This is amazing. The Son of God is here. Game on. Everything changes right now. And then the angels leave. Well, here's what's so interesting about that. There's a couple things I want you to know about this. Is that there were angels, or angels, <laughs> confuse that. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. This is when they show up. Here's something I want you to see. What they were doing. They were actually keeping watch. Another word for this in the New Living says they were guarding. They had a focus and they had a mission. And when the shepherds show up, I don't know if you catch this, the shepherds, or shepherds, that's twice, the angels, when the angels show up and they tell the shepherds, hey, this amazing thing has happened, they never tell the shepherds to go. They just say, this happened. Then they do a little conference where the shepherds get together and they say, did you hear that? That's amazing. And then they decide, we should go. They were not directed to, but they decide, we should go. To do that, here's what they have to do. They have to leave what they're guarding. You realize your job's at risk. Your livelihood is at risk. If they leave the sheep that they are guarding, they are putting themselves in a position where it might cost them. And I want you to notice this. The shepherds were willing to risk. Mary was willing to obey. The shepherds were willing to risk the loss of their sheep. By the way, I just want to make a little correlation for you. The sheep that they were guarding, it's pretty special. Those lambs outside of Bethlehem were, were made, made, they were grown to be the sacrificial lambs that would be used in the temple. What a beautiful thought here. The idea being in the Old Testament that when, uh, when people sin, they would take a lamb and sacrifice it to pay the price for the sin. And here these, these shepherds were guarding sheep that were for the sacrifice, for the forgiveness of sins. And then they're invited to a better story. They're invited to a better sacrifice. They get to go see the Lamb of God in a manger. What a glorious, glorious moment. I want you to know one more thing about shepherds, though. The shepherds were the lowest class. In all of Israel, if, if you look at a class system of who had the best job and who had the worst job, shepherds would have been the lowest of the low. They often smelled like sheep. They lived outside. They were not the highest rung. And yet, in the middle of this amazing epic story, who does God call on? Who does God draw into the story and say, hey, there's a party going on and we want you to know about it? It was the low class shepherds. It reminds me of a story that I read in, a, in the book, one of my favorite books, what's called What's So Amazing About Grace. And he tells a story of grace where there's a, a lady who, uh, who is engaged to be married and she goes through the ritual of finding a place for the reception at the Hyatt in downtown Chicago. This is a pretty high-end place. She puts down a few thousand dollars for the, um, for the down payment. It's non-refundable. Sure enough, three days before the wedding, the groom says, uh, I'm out. I don't want to do this. Well, at first, of course, the, the woman is heartbroken. Well, she goes to the Hyatt and says, hey, can we get our money back? Um, the guy made a run for it, and they said, we are so sorry for what happened to you. But no, it's non-refundable. You have two options. You can forfeit the money or you can pay the remaining couple hundred dollars. It wasn't much. And go ahead with a party. And at first she was heartbroken. Not only did she lose the guy, she also lost all the money that she had invested for the reception. And then she had a funny idea. You see, about four years earlier, she had been out on the streets. And she knew what it was like to have a life that was rough and difficult. And so she went with a crazy idea. You know what we should do? Let's go ahead with a party, but instead of having all the wedding guests, let's invite the down and out of Chicago to the Hyatt and invite them in, and we'll go ahead and have a party. And they, of course, changed the, the menu to have boneless chicken in honor of the spineless groom who did not come be a part of it. You know, I was thinking about those people who were street people, those people who were the down and out, they were invited to a party beyond their social class. So were the shepherds. 
when the angel showed up that day and they said, hey, we want you to know, glory in the highest, Emmanuel's here. Jesus Christ has been born in Bethlehem. You can find him lying in a manger. And they get together and say, let's go see this amazing thing. And they go and they worship. And I want you to notice two things about the shepherds. First, we see it in verse 17 and 18. And when they had seen him, I don't know if you catch this, slow down, don't go past this. When they had seen him, this is the him that is Jesus Christ. This is the son of God who is now in living flesh right there in a manger. They had seen him. They spread the word concerning what they, what they had been told them about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Number one, I want you to notice that they were willing to risk. But then out of that, once they had seen the baby, they went out and they told everyone about him. Another thing that we see in verse 20, it says this. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told by those angels. Notice this. They were glorifying God and they were praising God. Yeah, they were willing to risk. And out of that risk, look at the gift they were given. They were part of an epic story where they were able to tell the good news. And number two, they were able to worship God in a way they would not have before. If you're looking for hope today, here's what I want you to know. If you want hope, don't look for it under your tree. Look for it in this, that you have a story that you have been called into that's worth retelling and you serve a God that's worth praising and glorifying. And he's calling you into that story. So we have Mary who's willing to obey and we have shepherds who are willing to risk. Well, there are other characters in the story. This looks oddly familiar, doesn't it? It's on almost every single Christmas card. 39% of all Christmas cards have this horrible picture. And I'm going to go ahead and say it's horrible. It's cute. It fits nicely on the card. But it's horribly inaccurate. And here's what I mean. These are the three wise men, the three kings, the three magi. The idea being that there are three gifts that come from 700 miles away in what used to be Babylon. And they came over to give gifts to Jesus. And here's what I want you to see. This is so painfully historically inaccurate for a couple of reasons. One, we don't know how many there were. There could have been three. But here's what we know for sure. If there were three, they were not alone. There is no way you are going to transport that much wealth over 700 miles of treachery, of possible robbery, and not have an armed detachment with you. This, picture this, and now picture armed guards on every side. Now you have it. By the way, these guys are coming from what used to be Babylon. A little background for you. There's a really interesting component here. Here's what they say. We have seen the star rise and we know that the king of the Jews has been born and we have come to pay homage. We have come to worship him. The problem is the prophecy about a star is nowhere in the Bible. We don't have that prophecy, but they did. And here's our guess. This is just a guess. I am. Scholars think this and I'm going to go ahead and, and, and go with them. In it. But I want you to know the Bible doesn't say this. I'm guessing. The place that they got that prophecy remember these guys are magi, is from the most famous magi that we know of. His name is Daniel. In fact, the Daniel from the Old Testament, Daniel in the lion's den, that Daniel wrote a bunch of prophecy. Our guess is that he wrote other prophecy that didn't make it into his book, which is in our Bible, but they knew and they believed and they followed. They traveled 700 miles to get to Jerusalem. And when they show up, they have this great question. I want you to see this. They show up and they get to Jerusalem. They don't go to Bethlehem. They go to the capital and they say, hey, uh, they ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And all Jerusalem is all shook up. And there's a couple reasons we think this. One of them is because when they say, where's the king that's been born? Everyone knows the king that's there, Herod, is crazy. He's insecure. And if there's another king that's about to rise, he's going to fight him. Problem number one. Number two, the Magi, it used to be Babylon. Now it's been part of the Parthian Empire. And the Romans that, the, that Israel's under, they had just conquered the Parthians about 60 years earlier, which means this is a rival group. And if there were more than three people with an armed detachment, that's going to shake up the entire city. But they ask, where is it that the, the king of the Jews is supposed to be born? I want you to notice two things about them. First, they had that prophecy that we don't have, but they saw it, and then they were willing to come. And this is so, so critical. We have Mary who is willing to obey and shepherds who are willing to risk. I think there's something about the Magi that I love. They were aware. 
I'm noticing that some of the greatest maturity that happens in lives is when we're simply aware. Aware of problems, aware of needs, aware of hurts, aware of stars rising in the east which say, hey, the king's been born. There's an awareness factor here. And let me go back to it. If all you're aware about is the Christmas tree and mistletoe, you're going to miss it. Are you aware of the real story that's being told? When it comes to this and when you break this down, I want you to see what, what happens when they actually get to Jesus because there's one of the most unusual things in history, and I think this is so critical. It says it in verse 211, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We always know about the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but if you, if you read too fast and you don't stop and think about it, you're going to miss something critical here. It was often um, customary for one country to send emissaries to another country whenever a king was born, and they would pay homage to that king, saying, we realize you are an authority. That makes sense. They would often bring gifts, and they would often bow down. But here's something really, really weird. There is a difference between bowing down, giving gifts, and paying homage, and this word right here. That's not normal. It says they worshipped him. You don't do that because a king is born. You do that when the king is born. I want you to notice a couple things in, in how they worship. One, they did bow down, but they were also willing to give. If you're missing hope this holiday season, perhaps the very thing you need to do and need to remember is the joy that comes with giving. And I don't mean the obligatory getting the gifts so that every person gets the, something to open, but giving outside of yourself, giving outside of the norm, giving outside of your inner circle. Sometimes giving is exactly what re sets the heart. So the Magi come and they get to worship. There's a little problem that the Magi bring. They brought gifts. They also brought trouble. Because when the Magi show up and ask Herod, where is the king of the Jews? They have set in motion a horrible, horrible event that centers around Bethlehem. Herod, in all of his fear, goes out and kills every child, male child, under the age of two in the entire region because he is afraid of this baby Jesus and what this means and the impact that that will have. See, the Magi brought gifts. They also brought trouble. And uh, an angel warns them, go back a different way. Herod is not who he says. In fact, Herod had lied and said, tell me where he is so I may come and worship as well. And it wasn't true. But this also puts uh, Jesus in mortal danger because as he's there in Bethlehem, he needs help. And so God shows up and shares something with another character in our story. He talks about it with, uh, with Joseph. See, he says to Joseph, there's a problem. Herod's coming after the boy. And I want you to notice the response of Joseph. It says, so he, that's Joseph. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and during the night, look at that, during the night, and left for Egypt. You got to get out of here. Herod's coming. The soldiers are coming. I love, anytime you look in scripture and you say immediately or during the night, right away, they got up and they got after and went. Joseph gets up and during the night, they left for Egypt. And I want you to notice, remember, these people were not at home. They weren't home for Christmas. There was no pageant. There was no Christmas tree. They didn't sing any Christmas carols. The first Christmas was devoid of all of the things we think about. But notice this. They leave Bethlehem and they travel all the way to Egypt. If you notice this, the key, this is 30 miles. This is not an easy trek. They did not get there by morning. Same kind of rest stops along the way. This is not easy travel, but God had prepared them. God gave them gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And most scholars believe that's exactly how they paid for the trip. And they stay in Egypt for a few years until Herod passes away. <laughs> you realize that this is part of the Christmas story, but it's long after Christmas Day. Because the adventure set in motion for Christmas, they don't end with one day. They're epic and they live far beyond. But I want you to notice about Joseph. So Joseph was willing to follow. Mary was willing to obey. The shepherds were willing to risk. The magi were willing to see they were aware. And we also see that Joseph was willing to follow. All of these characters are living this epic story, but I want you to know something much, much deeper about this story. This isn't a story of Mary. 
It's not a story of angels coming to shepherds. It's not a story about the Magi or stars or prophecies or Daniel. It's not about two empires. It, this isn't about Joseph leaving for Egypt. This is about the central character of the story, the central character of our story, the central character of history. His name is Jesus Christ. This is not just though about Jesus. This is about what happens coming out of that. I want you to know something that's so critical. Is that this story isn't a clean, happy, easy story. It's a difficult one. It wasn't a silent night, but it was a holy night. And what made it holy was Jesus. Because you have the Son of God leaving heaven, coming to earth, and coming to be a part of our story. I want us to pause for a moment and reflect on this. We're actually going to let the worship team's going to play the song, Oh Holy Night. And I want us to bring ourselves back out of our story, into this story, to hear this truth. That what makes it holy is Jesus. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared. And the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious morn Fall on your was born on oh, night divine on oh, night on oh, night divine taught us to love one another his law is love and his gospel is peace chains he shall break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy, in rainful chorus raise me with all our hearts. We raise His holy name. Rise, 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's Hebrew for praise the name of the Lord. What is it that's worth being praised? Jesus Christ left heaven and came here. I kept saying that every character in the story wasn't at home. It was no more true than for the ultimate character who left the ultimate home to come here. You realize Jesus Christ wasn't home for Christmas. His home is heaven, and he left there and traveled the greatest distance we can imagine to be a part of our hearts. You know, uh, we, we've named the, the series that we're in, Emmanuel, which means God with us. But if the Christmas story is all the story of Jesus, we actually miss the much deeper part because Jesus Christ left heaven and came here so that he could be with us. But if you don't look at the end of the story, you're actually going to miss some of the key components of of it. Because the, 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 the story of Christmas, once again, is not about Bethlehem. It's not about Nazareth. It's not about Egypt. It's not about shepherds or Mary or Joseph. It's about Jesus. But the story of Christmas doesn't end with Christmas Day. The story of Christmas comes to fruition on Easter morning. Never celebrate Christmas, Christmas or Christmas. Never celebrate Christmas on its own. It has to be tied to the deeper truth of connection with Easter. I want you to see this. Most important verse in the Christmas story is right here. Here it is. And Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last and died. Because the Christmas story was not about a manger. It was about Jesus Christ coming to earth so that he could live a perfect life, die on the cross, and then rise from the dead so that we could have a relationship with him at a deeper level. You see, it went from God with us, listen carefully, to God in us. And if you ever want hope for the holidays, if you ever want hope for your life, it will only ever be found in that because everything else you ever put your hope in will fail you. I don't know if you've ever had it where you had that Christmas present you desperately wanted. I had it, seventh grade year. I wanted a leather jacket because if I had a leather jacket, every girl would like me. I would be a popular kid. I just needed a leather jacket. And sure enough, Christmas morning, I got a leather jacket. And not every girl liked me. In fact, it was too big for me. And I just looked silly. I look like an undergrown It's funny, I'm the same size now as I was then. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter if you get the present because it will either be wrong or it will get old. It'll never satisfy. But if you remember what Christmas is based around and what it's focused on, if you realize that Christmas is simply a prelude to a great story where Jesus Christ lives a perfect life, dies on the cross, and rises from the dead. Remember how I told you that Mary was willing to obey and the shepherds were willing to risk and the magi were willing to see and that Joseph was willing to follow? Jesus was willing to die. The distance Jesus traveled from heaven to the cradle was immense. It was even farther to the grave and back. He died and rose again. Remember that story where I said I was alone for Christmas? I wasn't around other people, but I want you to know a better part of the story. I wasn't alone. Not really. Yeah, there weren't other people there. But I was a part of a Christmas story where Jesus Christ came to earth from from heaven, was born and put in a manger, and then lived a perfect life and died on the cross for me. And yeah, I sat by myself at Applebee's, and I woke up in the morning, and there was no one else in the apartment, but Jesus was with me. And let me tell you, if you're struggling with what Christmas looks like. There is no other change that can happen than whether or not you give your life to Jesus and say, I want the real story because the real story of Christmas isn't found on Hallmark. It's found with an empty tomb in Jesus Christ. We've got a couple questions for you. We're going to hand off to the campuses and for those of you watching online. I love you guys. 
Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm the South Umpqua campus pastor. And whether you're joining us from our South Umpqua campus, we love you guys. We're so happy you got to join us today or online. We love you and thank you for joining us. Uh, the thing that we really want to leave you with today is we want to challenge you to be vulnerable. Um, as Will talked about the obedience that we see throughout the Christmas story. Um, we want you to share with somebody in your life. Maybe it's somebody that is mentoring you or discipling you or somebody in your community that's uh, in your life group or uh, in your, your home church. Uh, we want to challenge you to share vulnerably about a time where you really struggled to obey. And here's the caveat that I want to add to it. I want you to share about something that you're recently struggling with. Uh, as, as we've been talking about obedience, it made me think about, you know, when there's brokenness in our lives, when there's the, the, the desire to not obey God, um, it often cannot be restored until it, 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 well, in fact, it cannot be restored until it is revealed first. The first step in restoration is bringing that brokenness, bringing that unwillingness to the surface and doing that in community. So we want to challenge you, uh, whatever that is for you, Take a bold step of faith. Share with one of your brothers or sisters in Christ where you're struggling today to obey God. We love you guys. I'd love to pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you left heaven to come to earth. I can't imagine that sacrifice. Um, and I'm so grateful, God. And in, not just to come to earth, but come to a broken world where you would be um, given the death penalty. God, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you that because of you, we can bring our brokenness to the surface. And because of the gospel, we can receive restoration. I pray that Family Church would be a place where broken people are being restored and transformed. Help us to have courage, God, as we, are, we discuss the areas that we're struggling. Help us to be real with people and authentic in our relationships. Uh, God, give us listening ears. And um, I pray that as, as these areas of struggle are, are shared, they would be met with grace, not judgment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's so awesome to get to do this with you. And if, if you would let us know how we could be praying for you in the online connect card, we'd love to be praying for you. We have a, actually a whole team of people who do that. So please let us know how can we be praying for you during the season. Have a great week.